Hey, inside your uh, program is an outline. Today we will be starting a new series. We did one last year on Be Rich, and it was a fun series um, that we did last year. We're going to kind of take it and, and start making it our, an annual uh, lesson that we do during the year. And so just kind of FYI, just kind of get a little idea of what it is. Um, so we have an impact, uh, a community impact team that meets earlier in the year, and they go out and they find some organizations and ministries um, that are doing some great things in the community, making a difference. And then they vet them out and just kind of see what they're doing and, and all that kind of stuff. Then they make a, a pitch to me as far as what ministries or what organizations that they think that we should um, participate in coming alongside of and supporting financially for a season as well as uh, encourage them, uh, encourage our folks to get involved in it. And so Pillars of Hope uh, is our ministry that they selected this year. And so we'll talk more about it and at the end of the service. There'll be a video that will kind of explain a little bit about what their ministry is. And so just to kind of big picture stuff, there's some envelopes around you. And so over the next couple weeks, we're going to encourage you um, to, to be generous, to bless them uh, financially. 100% of whatever you give in that little envelope that says community impact, I think it says, 100% of that will go directly to, to their ministry. And so we'll talk about that more over the next couple weeks. And I think it, it'll be fun. Last year we did uh, Kaleidoscope, which was, uh, is an organization that helps folks with cancer. And so this year we're doing Pillars of Hope. So are you ready? Yeah. All right. So t- we're going to talk over the next couple weeks about being good at being rich, okay? And this is what I just kind of want to let everybody know. No one in here is rich, so just relax. We're not talking about you, all right? So you're okay. You're going to fly under the radar. You don't feel rich. You're not rich. And so we're, we're not going to talk, but here's what I want you to know. I want you, as a pastor, I want you that if there's ever a day when you are rich, I want you to be good at it, okay? So I don't want anybody being bad at being rich. No one wants to be bad at anything, right? When when I became a pastor years ago, it's like, my goal is I want to be like the worst pastor in American history, right? No, No one wants to do that. When I got married, it's like, I want to be the worst husband I possibly can. Dad, no one does that. Does any of you guys, you guys sign up to be the worst in the world? No, right? So let's have a little fun, all right? You guys seem like you're pretty quiet and shy. I'm not sure if you're, you trust me? Got two people, all right. And my wife didn't say anything. So here we go, all right. <clears throat> How many of you have ever written a bad, you're, you're like the boss, you know, you're a person that someone reports to you, and you got a chance to write a bad review about a person that reports to you. And I just, if, you, if you've ever had that experience, just go ahead and raise your hand. Keep your hand up. Keep your hand up. Now, those of you who don't have your hand up, have you ever received a bad report? And did any of them write that, all right? Because at the end, we're going to have a little fighting match over here in the corner, all right? All right, you can put your hands down. Let me ask you this. How many of you have ever had an opportunity to write a Yelp review? We all done that? Yeah? How many of you, some of you are smiling, I already know. How many of you have ever had an opportunity to write a bad review? Come on, let's see your hands up. Yeah, see, look at you're proud too. It's like, yep, service was terrible, all right? I I didn't even go home. It was like in the parking lot. This place is the worst. And you did a selfie so they know who you were, right? Is that right? All right. How many of you have ever written a good review? Anybody? Oh, yeah. Okay. So you got some nice, sweet people here today. All right. Good. All right. So, so he, here, here's what it is. <clears throat> no one has ever had a bad experience in some type of, you know, business, restaurant, whatever the case is. I'm hoping. And the manager or the owner, I mean, you had a horrible experience. The manager probably never came up to you and said, you had a horrible experience today. And you're like, oh, yeah, this place is terrible. It's like the worst service known to mankind. Good. Can you write a bad review on Yelp for us, right? Has anybody ever had that where the manager said, please write a bad review? No. Yeah, someone said, yeah. (laughs) That was me. You wrote it about me. Thank you. (laughs) So, So no one likes to be good at being bad. Does that make sense, right? No, no, one, no one signs up for that, 
right? So Paul writes, and this is kind of a weird verse that we're going to look at. Paul writes to Timothy, who's his understudy. And Paul wants Timothy to be a great pastor in the, in the New Testament church. And he writes him, and it's kind of a weird thing he says to him. He says, Timothy, you're going to come across Christians, Christ followers, in the church. And I want you to tell them this. When they are rich, be good at it. Don't, don't be bad at being rich. I want, you to be, I want you to tell them to be good at being rich. Now, again, none of us are rich, so we don't have to worry about applying any of this to us in our life. We're all going to be in good shape. We're going to skate through, and it is not going to apply to us at all, all right? So you are clear. This is not for you. How many got a rich uncle? Anybody got a rich uncle? It's for them, okay? That, this message is for them, not for any of you, because none of us here are rich, all right? So what I want to do in your outline, go ahead and open it up, in our culture, Wealth does some strange things, and I got some support documentation, some surveys and studies that have done, uh, that have been done that kind of validate my point here. Number one in your outline is there's a side effect to wealth, right? And there's actually multiple, but we want to keep it just minimal. <clears throat> Letter A in your outline, and this doesn't apply to any of us, all right? Wealthy people are plagued by discontentment. Okay? Wealthy people are plagued by discontentment. In other words, we think or we hear from outside that if you have money, you'll be content in life because you will actually be able to buy contentment. And if you have enough greenbacks, you'll just be able to buy it and everything will be good. But actually, that isn't the case. What it does do, wealth, is it creates a hunger in us to want more, okay? And so what wealth does, it's like certain kinds of food that triggers your body to be hungry. You know, you know what I'm talking about, all right? You eat certain things and it, your body's like starving, right? And you're like, I just ate, but your body's screaming out starving. When we buy things, it doesn't it doesn't stop us from wanting more. It actually encourages us to want more. Little retail side story. Do you know why they do buy one, get half off the next one? Right? Do you know why they give samples of food in certain stores? It's not because they want to feed you. Right? Because they know when you get the whatever it is, like, where's that at? That's good stuff right there, right? And you want to buy it. And so when you go in and you buy something, you buy one, you get half off the next whatever it is, it creates a desire to want more in your life. Would you guys agree with that? Now, none of us, but wealthy people that we know, you know, rich Uncle Joe that, you know, has got a ton of money and uh, he doesn't know what to do with it. It just creates a little bit of money. So as I began to do this, I thought, you know what? It'd be kind of fun to look at how homes were developed pre-1950 compared to today. And you kind of go, well, why is that? In 1950 back, most homes was built with one car garage, right? In fact, in certain communities, in certain neighborhoods, they didn't even have an attached to garage. They had a building kind of in the back of the lot where they would do it, right? And the theory was, as the World War II began to, came winding down and there was an urban sprawl and all that kind of stuff, this suburban sprawl that was going on, the idea was is that most families had one car. And you had one car, and you parked that one car in that one car garage, and you were good, right? So we talk about closet space. <laughs> you don't want to go there. You're like, no, we're good. Let's just, we believe you. We believe you, Pastor Dan. We're 100%. Prior to 1950, most homes had very small closets. In fact, some of you in certain, in certain uh, areas of, of the country, they had no closets. You actually had, a, you know, basically a, a portable storage unit that you put your clothes in. Because in that time, you basically had a pair of clothes for work, a pair of clothes for play, and a pair of clothes to work on, you know, scrubbies to work on, right? You didn't have the massive clothes and the stuff that we have today, 
right? Are you with me? Fast forward 2017. Now, <clears throat> I'm not, you know, a home builder or anything, but I am like you know, maybe the 18th smartest guy in this room. And so when I'm driving around and I'm looking at new homes being built, I have not found one single subdivision that's building homes. Now, condominiums may be different, but building homes with one car garage. Anybody? Now, full disclosure, because some of you have been to my house, I have a four car garage. So just get that out of the way. All right. My mind is out because I, oh, yeah, four-car garage, Pastor Dan, all right. So, right, <clears throat> I've not found one, all right? Closet space. Should we even go there? Just call it good? Some of your closet spaces are bigger than the be bedroom that I grew up in, right? Are you with me on that? And we had three boys in that room, okay? So the homes have increased, Right? And what's interesting is this. Do you know the storage business in America is huge? Do you know that, now none of us, because we don't, we're lucky to have like two nickels to rub together, right? You're, I mean, you're lucky you have two pairs of shoes that match, right? One in 10 people who don't attend Laurel Ridge Church own <laughs> are renting a storage unit. Now, none of us, but the wealthy church down the road. Fat cats, right? All of them. One in ten have a storage unit. Now, now just, just pause. Help me out because I'm not, again, I'm the 18th smartest guy in this room. If a two-car garage or three-car, or in Dan, Pastor Dan's case, four-car garage isn't big enough, and I have to go out and buy a storage unit or rent a storage unit, what does that tell me about contentment with stuff? Does it not support the fact that wealthy people are not content and they have to buy more stuff? So much that when they fill up the two-car garage or three-car garage, they actually have to go out and rent a storage unit, right? Now, you guys are pretty sharp. According to the study, sixteen. This is a, from a storage unit uh, website. You guys fill in the blanks. In 2017, the storage industry in America profited 22, or 32.7, what do you think it is? Billion. Billion. $32.7 billion in storage. Now, my hunch is... Two and two is four. If a two car and three car and a four car for Fat Cat Pastor Dan isn't big enough, and I got to go down the street and rent their storage unit, there's a contentment problem that's going on in my life. Would you agree with that? You don't agree with that. Some of you are like, no, I don't want to agree with that. Because <laughs> the next thing he's going to say is sell the stuff that you have, right? I don't want to sell the stuff, all right? So one in 10 has a storage unit. Uh, $32.7 billion. The average person pays in America $87.15 per month for their storage unit. And the average cost per square foot, those of you in retail stuff, is $0.97 cents per foot per month. Now, that's, that's almost as much as some main retail space, which is actually pretty great. So when you look at it from an investment standpoint, you got like almost nothing to do. You, you build these boxes with a garage door and people are spending, you know, 80, 90 bucks a month to pour, put their stuff in that won't fit in their three-car garage and their four-car garage and their walk-in closets. And so they put it in there and it's, it's a cash cow for them, right? Now, what does that tell us? It just tells us in our culture that wealthy people are not content and that in them they just want to go out and they want to purchase things because they're not content letter b you guys glad you're here today yeah. all right letter b wealthy people think that if i just make a little bit more then i'll be wealthy and content all right so there's some surveys about that <clears throat> and so Here's what Gallup did, and, and then Charles Schwab also did, came back and did another one 
so they asked America, um, Americans, what would they consider to be rich to make an annual salary? What would it be? And the number was 150,000 bucks. So if you made 150,000 bucks, now some of you are sitting here, you got dual income. You're like, I don't feel rich at all. We'll talk about that next week, right? But, but $150,000 a year, they considered, uh, they said, if you made that, you'd be rich, all right? So they asked people who made $35,000, how much would you need to be rich? And their answer was $75,000, right? And so you can see that the line keeps moving. It gets bigger. Right? And so in my premarital class that I teach for folks who are getting married, we do a budget area. And so in that class, I oftentimes say, how much would you like to set aside for you to feel comfortable that you got something for a rainy day? Right? And, you know, it's just as working them through, especially younger couples that are coming out of college and stuff. And so it's just like, what would you need for a rainy day? Well, here's what I learned through the years. You know, they'll say whatever the number is. It's like, oh, if we just save like 1500 bucks, we would be great. Right. And then I come back around, you know, hey, how are you doing on your budget? Oh, we got fifteen hundred. But you know what, Pastor Dan, we started thinking and then I thought about my car and then I thought, you know, I got a washer and dryer and it doesn't makes a funny noise. And I'm concerned about, you know, this, that. So we think that we need to save twenty five hundred bucks. Right. And then, and then it just keeps getting out farther and farther and farther because they're playing the what if. Well, what if this breaks? Well, what if that breaks? Well, what if this breaks? And there's a line when it comes to wealth that we think is there. But as soon as we get there, it moves. Right. Because we're never content with what we have. And we think that if we just make more, we would be great. Charles Schwab did a, uh, a study last year. And they asked people um, for retirement. So this is total, you know, li kind of liquid assets, including home, uh, homes, 401ks, and all that kind of stuff. What would you need to consider yourself wealthy in America? And the number was $2.4 million. Total net worth, including, you know, houses that you could sell and so forth, right? Now, what's interesting is in 2013, they asked the same question. It was $5 million. So it actually, actually dropped in what they thought was going to make them comfortable. And the point just being this, that what wealth does is, one, it creates, it stimulates us to want more, but it's also an imaginary line that we never can reach because every time we think that if we just get a certain amount, we get there and that line moves, right? And so we're constantly striving for more for more, and as a result, what ends up happening is it doesn't create peace in our soul. Some of you know this because you look back and you've saved, and your savings counts have grown, but your peace in your heart hasn't. And the reason why, and we're going to see this in next week, is because we're putting our trust in our money, and when we get there, we're not sure that it's enough. Right. And if I just get a little bit more and a little bit more. And so as a result, we're just never content with it in our life. Are you got me? OK, you guys with me? If you have your Bibles, first Timothy, chapter six. And this is Paul writing to Timothy to to encourage him that you are going to come across believers, people who love Jesus, people who are in the New Testament church, and they're going to be wealthy. All right. And so this was a couple thousand years ago, but it's going to be completely compatible in our culture. And Paul tells Timothy, listen, because as a shepherd or a pastor, you are to watch over the souls of the people, right? That's primarily the lead pastor's job is to be the shepherd of the flock, to build them up to be all that God wants them to be, all right? And so Paul is training Tim Timothy, and he's saying, listen, you are going to shepherd their souls, and you're going to come across believers who love Jesus, who are wealthy, and I want to encourage you to give them a little instructions in life. So if you have your Bibles, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. The, very, the first of it, here's what he says. He says, I want you to command them. And you can write above that. That word is instruct. Okay? So he tells them, command them or instruct those who are rich in this present day. Now remember, we're talking a couple thousand years ago in the New Testament church. But it's going to be completely compatible with where we are in our life. And so he's going to give them some problems spiritually 
about wealth. Okay, Things to be careful that if we're not careful and we're not paying attention, we're going to fall into the same trap. All right? it, and so he says, number one, Roman 2, 2 in your outline, the problems of wealth in our spiritual life. So write that down. And then letter A is wealthy Christ followers often pull away from depending on God. Okay, now just, just kind of get the fill in the blanks done. You guys good? I, I mean, I have, I have all day. I'm, I'm, it's all good. I'll just stay here as long as you all want me here. You good? You got it down? Yeah. All right. So, so he says to them, he says, listen, wealthy Christ followers, they have the potential to pull away. Now, I've never met a believer that says, man, I am so grateful for what Jesus, he set me free, he's forgiven me of my past, he, he's, he's given me victory in the future in the heaven, uh, for heaven when I die, but here's my goal. I just want to drift away from God. Anybody? No, no one. But it happens all the time, right? It happens all the time that we get kind of preoccupied and we just kind of pull away. And so Paul writes to Timothy and he says, listen, there's going to be wealthy believers, Timothy, that you're going to come across. And the concern that we have for them is their dependence on God is going to begin to shift over and they're going to begin to put all their trust in their money. And they're going to walk away from who provides it for them. Now, not in the sense of losing salvation, but in the sense of that they're just, their focus is going to migrate and it's going to begin to change. And he says, so command those who are rich in this present world. And then verse 17 goes on and he says, not to be arrogant. And we'll just stop right there. In, in other words, he says this. He says, and we see it in TV or with movie stars and sports people and, and that kind of stuff, that when, when they, for some reason, when someone signs a big old fat contract, contract, they think that their IQ goes up to the same level as their bank account. Are you with me on that? Yeah. Right? I mean, someone signs a $100 million contract, and then they get in front of the mic, and you're like, ay, 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 ay. just go, go, right? You're not that smart, right? You can do whatever, sing, dance, whatever it is, but you're not that smart, just kind of exit. But, but Paul says, listen, he, here's the problem. You're going to get a promotion, you're going to land a great job. You're going to create a business that's profitable. You're going to do some amazing things. You're going to work hard. And you're going to look in the mirror and you're going to go, huh, I'm somebody, right? And you're going to actually think that your IQ is actually ra has risen to the level of your bank account. And you're going to think that you're somebody. And he says you're going to become arrogant in your thinking and your dependence on who's provided that to you, and you're going to begin to look at yourself, right? And this is kind of a thing that we need to be careful of, that when we're blessed by God, we need to make sure that all the praise goes back to Him. Otherwise, we think we are somebody, right? And we're not, right? We're not. We're just fortunate to be used by God and be blessed by God. And we need to recognize that in our life. But he just says, hey, make sure that those who are, who are rich in this current uh, world do not be arrogant. And the verse goes on. He says, nor to put their hope in wealth, <clears throat> which is so uncertain. Right? And we all know how wealth is. I mean, the stock market goes up. The home values go up. Eight years ago, we had a disaster in real estate. I mean, we got all kinds of things that take place. And in, in the market, it's... Wealth is uncertain, right? It's constantly changing. You, you don't know what it is. And, and, and he says, here's a temptation. The wealthy Christians, right, believers in Jesus, they're going to say, look, at, look what I've made. Look how much I've done. Look how I built my whatever it is. Look how I've climbed up the corporate ladder. And then they're going to look at their big old pile of stuff. And they're going to go, you know how many storage units I have? It's filled. I got a big old pile. And they're going to put all their hope in that. And they're going to trust in it. And the problem is, is that, as we've experienced in the past, we never know what the market's going to do. And the market's good today. It could crash tomorrow. Right? And yet Paul says, as he talks to Timothy a couple thousand years ago, he says, listen, they put all their hope in their wealth, which is so uncertain in their life. Look at Proverbs. We looked at this in the last uh, series when we did uh, 
wisdom. Proverbs 18, written by the wealthiest man who ever lived and the wisest man who ever lived. And here's what he said. Wealth of the rich is their, what is it? It's their city. And just stop right there. In other words, in those days, to keep enemy armies out or enemy nations out, they would build walls. And on those walls would be military people, and they would stand up on the top, and as the armies would come in or the enemies would come in, they would shoot their bows or their arrows or throw rocks at them, whatever it was, and they would, they would fortify their city. And we've probably all gone to some on a field trip back in elementary school. You've gone to some fort, and it's kind of the same type of idea. And they have this thing, and he says the rich people think that their wealth is like a fortified city that they are untouchable. And he goes on and he says, they imagine. In other words, it's a pipe dream. And yet they believe it. That they imagine that their wealth is an unscalable wall. That it's going to fix all their problems. It's going to solve everything. And if you just get whatever that imaginary number is, if you just get there, all your problems will, be, will, will, will go away. You'll be bulletproof right? Now, he's not talking to unbelievers. He's talking to believers. He's telling Timothy, because Timothy, because we care for the souls of the people that God has entrusted us, as a shepherd, I want you to make sure that they don't have their, have their dependency on God migrate or drift away. Now, here's the temptation. None of us will wake up tomorrow and say, we are rich. I'm putting all my trust in my stuff. None of you will do that. But the temptation is, is that we will slowly begin to migrate over, and that's what we do. It's a slow shift. It's not a sudden one, and it's not screaming out. It's a slow shift that we just begin to put what wasn't hope in a God, now it becomes hope in our things that we have. And where we depended on God to supply, supply all of our needs, now we depend on our bank account, our 401k, our ability, our job, or whatever it is to provide for us. You okay? <clears throat> so here's the question. How much money would you need to secure your future? Last week I had a meeting with, a, with my financial planner on my retirement. It was a time for that review. He gave me a number that I needed. Right? Pastors oftentimes opt out of Social Security, so Social Security isn't, isn't a part of our, my financial plan in the future, and so he gives me a number. He says, Dan, you got to get to this in order for you to, to live you know, comfortably when you retire. <clears throat> what is the number for you? I know the answer. Do you want to know the answer? A little more than what you currently have. <laughs> isn't that the answer? Because some of you are sitting here and you're like, you know, you, you got two million bucks in, t you know, total assets in retirement, right? And you're, maybe you're, you know, my age or whatever it is, and you're like, huh. And then all of a sudden, Pastor Dan says, five million bucks. Ho, 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 I got to start saving, right? Maybe you got 250 and you're just starting out. But, but all I know is, is that when, when you think you're there, all of a sudden you begin to wonder if that's going to be enough. And it isn't. And so what do you do? You strive for more. And you have subtly, right, put your dependence on your things and not the one who provides for you, right? Now, it's not like you woke up and you just say, I deny Jesus. I'm, you know, I'm totally into the greenbacks, right? But suddenly it shifts and instead of relying on the provider, you begin to re rely, rely on the provisions, Okay? <clears throat> Jesus said it this way. Well, I guess I'll go back to 2 Timothy, uh, or 1 Timothy 6, 17. He goes on in that verse and he says, but to tell them to put their hope in, in who? In God. Right? And Jesus said it this way in Matthew 6, 21. <clears throat> For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In other words, the things that you sit today with, at, you know, whether it's people, relationships, your career, whatever it is, the things that you treasure in your life, there is a cord that's connected to your heart to it. And Jesus says, it's simple for me to find your heart. 
All I need to do is find what you treasure, and then I'll just trace the line back, and I will find what you treasure because they're connected. Your treasure and your hearts are connected, right? And Jesus says, <clears throat> Jesus says, where your heart is, there your treasure will be also, verse 24. No one can serve two masters. Either he'll hate one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one, and he'll despise the other one. No one, uh, you cannot serve both God and money. It's impossible, right? The temptation is, is that you're going to have all of your care and all of your focus in one or the other, right? And the temptation for all of us in this room is, is that it slowly begins to migrate away from trusting in God, okay? Several years ago, um, we had a couple uh, World War II vets in um, as we know, most of that, many of those, that generation has passed away. But one of the guys had, had fought in some pretty major battles. And he had crazy stories to tell about how they lived down on the field and stuff. And one day I was talking in a message about atheism. And, you know, and he comes up to after, after service is over. And he, and he, and he tells me this, this thing. And I still, still remember. It's probably been like 15, 18 years ago. He comes up and he says, Pastor... There's no such thing as an atheist in a foxhole. And he starts to walk away. And I'm like, what does that mean? Hey, come over here. What, what does that mean? And he says, well, you see, when I was in World War II and we were fighting wherever he was fighting, he said, the guys are marching and they're walking around and it's no gunfights, no, none of that's going on. And they're all arrogant and they're walking around about how cool they are and what they're going to do and blah, 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 blah. And he said, and then all of a sudden, the bullets start whizzing over our heads, and the artillery is shooting, and they're in the foxhole. And he said, every single one of them is relying and believing in God. Yeah. And I thought, interesting. And he said, there's no such thing as an atheist in a foxhole, right? Because you only have one thing to trust in, and that's God. And Paul says to Timothy, when you find rich believers, you need to encourage them because we all know at the end or when the bullets are whizzing over their head in the foxhole, they're going to believe in God. And you just need to tell them in the middle of their life, they need to trust him too. They need to live as if he's the provider, not just in the foxhole when they're getting taken on in a, in a gunfight, but also when they're walking through life and things are going well. Because the temptation, whether it's 2,000 years ago or it's 2017, the temptation is, is that our dependence drifts from God. And we begin to trust in our stuff. And yet, we all know that at the end, whatever that time may be, we're completely sold out for God. In fact, this is, and we've all said it, so I'm not throwing you under the bus. This is when <clears throat> someone that you love has gone to the doctors, they've gone through treatment, they've gone through every type of medical thing known to possible to mankind, and we've all made these statements, so I'm not throwing you under the bus. We've all said, hey, the only thing I know to do is to trust God, right? Because at the end, that's all you can do. And Paul tells Timothy, listen, when you bump into these rich Christians, you, you just need to let them know early on, be, be, before the end, you need to just say to them, you need to trust God now in the middle of your life, not just in the end when maybe there's a bad report, right? Be, because the, the temptation is, is that we begin to drift in our trust, in your outline. And I believe this wholeheartedly, and that's this, that wealth becomes the substitute for God. Wealth becomes a substitute for God. The vast majority of folks, <clears throat> it, it's not, you know, I, I'm not sure, do I want to go to the occult or do I want to go to, you know, Laurel Ridge? I mean, I don't think it's that. The vast majority is, it's wealth and the privileges that wealth provides for us. And it becomes a substitute 
for God. It's not a decision you wake up on Monday and say, that's it, I'm sold out to, you know, whatever it is. It's just a slowly migration away from completely trusting God. Proverbs, again, verse 30. Keep falsehoods and lies from my, uh, far from me. We're all in favor of that. Give me neither poverty nor what? So I hope none of you are asking for riches. But give me only my daily bread. Why is that? Well, otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Right? So that's a temptation that we all have where we're all of a sudden it just slowly begins to, to migrate away. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 goes on. He says, but put their hope in God who richly, what's he do? He richly provides us with everything for our He doesn't care if your garage is full. He just doesn't want you to worship it and it become your God. He doesn't care how big your stack is. He just doesn't want you to put all your trust in it. He doesn't care if you got a walk-in closet as big as this room filled and you stand in front of it on Sunday and say, Honey, I don't have anything to wear to church. Oh, you may have said something like that, right? He doesn't care. He just doesn't want you to put your trust and hope in it. It's that simple. And so at the verse, you go on, and it's kind of, as you go through it, you're like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Because he's like, don't do, you got to live kind of like a, a, you know, a, a simple life and not have anything. And then he says, no, no, I give this stuff for your enjoyment. Just don't worship it. Just recognize it's from the provider. It's not the provisions that we worship. You okay with that? Right? And so in your outline, it says here, and we'll look at this over the next couple weeks, I will not place my hope in riches, but in him who richly provides for us, right? And so that's, that's the goal of the series as we begin to work through, all right? So first thing is, <clears throat> wealth has a, has a potential of us moving away, migrating our hope away from God and not d- depending on him completely. Letter B in your outline is wealthy Christ followers often get distracted from God's priorities. You Okay. So I'm going to talk candid with you guys. In America today, when I started 26 years ago in the ministry, here's how it went. All right? Don't put anything away. I'm not done yet. Okay? I'm going to give you the winning lottery lottery numbers or the super mega numbers. You're going to become rich, and you're going to be good at it. All right? So here it is. 26 years ago, the average, if you were a good Christian, you would come to church Four times a month, okay? For those of you, that's basically every Sunday a month, okay? (laughs) If you were average, you would come three times, okay? If you were below average, two times. If you were on the fringes, once, okay? You got that number? Four, yay! Three, good, Two, mm, one, uh, right, okay? <laughs> today, in today, culture, in churches, not just in California, throughout the United States. It's, it's almost two, but it's like 1.965 something for the average pers- uh, Christ follower to come to church. So they've done all kinds of studies, and they got guys that are brainiacs and all kinds of, you know, statistical wonks and all this stuff, and surveys and pastors and all this other stuff. Is the church boring? Is it not this? Is it not that? And they got that, 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 right? And so what they basically come down is this, that the wealth in America is affording Christ followers who love Jesus opportunities to do other things. So it isn't an issue of we don't like church, we don't like Jesus, we don't like Pastor Dan, we don't like Pastor whoever it is. That isn't the issue. The issue is, is that we have wealth now to do multiple things. And so church becomes where before it was like the place that you would go to be encouraged, to be a part of a community, to be used by God, all that stuff. 
It's just becoming one of many opportunities that we all have. Right. And, and so, I mean, just kind of thing. And it's not us, but it's like, you know, our rich Uncle Bob. Right. Rich Uncle Bob. I mean, he's got season tickets. He's got a boat. He's got a ski do. He's got snowmobiles. You know, he's got a helicopter. He's got all this stuff going on. And when he wakes up. Right. He looks at whatever's going on in the time period and he makes a decision of where he wants to go and what he wants to do. And church is just kind of one of them. All right. Where in earlier in American history. We didn't have that kind of well. So this is like right around uh, world, the end of World War II and, or, and earlier. We didn't have that kind of wealth. People didn't have two nickels to rub together. They were barely eking by. Right? And so they didn't have multiple choices of it. And this is the danger as a pastor looking at our folks. This is the danger in which, in which we're faced. And that is... People who love Jesus, when I run into them at the store, man, they're like, hey, Pastor Dan, you know, my prayer life's good, blah, blah, blah. But they're distracted from God's priorities. See, we say, hey, worship is important, and all the church people said, amen. We say community groups is where you grow spiritually and where you get connected, where you meet people. Amen. But serving in a ministry is where you begin to use your gifts, talents, and abilities for the kingdom of God. Amen. Hey, where you been? Fill in the blank. You with me? Right? And I'm not throwing anybody under the bus. I'm just being candid with you. Because I think it's important that we're just honest with it. And, and Paul says, right, not just 2017, Paul goes all the way back 2,000 years ago. He said the same thing. That wealth has the ability in our life to afford us opportunities to do other things. And we get distracted from God's priorities. Right? Would you, would you agree with that? It doesn't mean you're a bad person. It just... It, it's, just the, it's just reality, right? And yet at the same time, you've got to wrestle with this. Is it wrong to have an RV? No. Is it wrong to go on a family vacation? No. Is it wrong to go to a sports event? No. <laughs> Depends on what team you go to. If it's in Santa Clara, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Some of you are like, well, where's Santa Clara? It's for our enjoyment but it's not a substitute for God. You with me? Yeah. Right? So verse 18 goes on, or, uh, 1 Timothy 6, verse, uh, verse 18 goes on. Here's, here, and here's what he says. <clears throat> Command them to do, to do good. Right? Now, we all want to do good, and we all want to be blessed, and we want to live a blessed life, and we think that if we pack it, stack it up, that that's going to give a blessed life. And Paul says, no, that's not the answer. So look what he says. He says, command them to do good, to be rich in what? In deeds, right? To be generous and willing to share. Now watch this in verse 19. In this way, right? In this way, when you're generous, when you're willing to share, when you're rich in good deeds, in this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as firm foundation for the coming age. In other words, in heaven, the treasures that we're planting in heaven for our generosity here on earth, for our service to the king here on earth, is going to be placed in a account in heaven that never has a down day on the stock market in heaven. Okay? It's, it's a little bit that we give that grows great in heaven, all right? And he says, so when we're rich in good deeds, generous, willing to share, in this way, they lay up treasures for themselves on a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life, and that is, and what's the last two words in that verse? And here's the truth. Every single one of us wants to live a blessed life life. And that's what that means, that they will experience truly the purpose of life. But it isn't stacking it up. It's not having your priorities turn away from God. It's being generous, willing to share, and being rich in good deeds. It's not what we're taught outside, right? 
Now, as you sit here today, before we wrap up, the reason why we have garages filled with stuff, and I'm just being very candid with you, and I struggle with the same struggles you guys do. The reason why we struggle with low self-esteem and thinking that if we just buy and just have and just drive and just own, that somehow we're going to feel good about ourselves is because we're putting our hope and our trust in it. And only Jesus Christ, only Jesus Christ can fill your life with contentment. And Paul says, Timothy, there's going to be a lot of great people that love Jesus. And they're going to struggle with this. And they're going to get a little bit and their their focus is going to migrate over. And he says, I just want you to tell them that they will never find purpose and meaning unless they're willing to be rich in good deeds, generous in their life, and willing to share. Otherwise, you will own a storage unit, and then eventually you'll buy the whole place out. And you will still never have contentment because it feeds itself. And that is true for every single one of us, right? Pastor Dan isn't exempt from it. That is true for all of us. So here's your take-home truth. We need to understand that we, regardless of where we're at financially in our life, as believers, we have a greater responsibility. Maybe, Maybe it isn't so much that we can give financially in large amounts, but we have time, we have talents, we have abilities. And we need to have we need to recognize we have a greater responsibility. Second one is this: that God has blessed us with more than we need. And if you struggle with that and you don't believe me, just have me come over to your house and I'll point out the second pair of shoes that you have in your closet that you have more than you need. You are rich. Now, we don't feel it. You got to come back next week and we'll talk about why you don't feel that. Here's a couple fill in the blanks and I expect a couple hallelujahs here, all right? If you make $34,000 a year, you're in the top 1% wage earners in the world. Any hallelujahs here? (laughs) You're like, I make that and maybe more and I don't feel rich. Next week, you got to come back, all right? If you make $80,000 a year, you're in the top, see that point there? 0.1% of wage earners in the world. Anybody want to swallow? See, what's interesting is no one stood up in the first service and said, hallelujah, we're rich. Everyone felt like you. It's expensive to live in the Bay Area, Pastor Dan. (laughs) It's three bucks a gallon. I got a $2,500 house payment. My kids go to some preschool. It's like nine bazillion dollars a week, right? They're in full-time whatever it is thing, and it's like 600 bucks a month to play softball or whatever it is, right? And so you sit here, and I totally get it, man. I totally get it. You're like, I don't feel rich. And here's the deal, okay? It's not going to be how much you make, but it's going to be what you do with your life. And that's going to be the difference. Wealth will never buy contentment. It never will. And wealthy people, not to make light of it, wealthy billionaires that invented contraptions that have fruit on it, die. You with me? Right? So even even the wealthiest at the end will have to make a decision. And Paul says, hey, just trust God. Do it in the middle. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a little preview video of Pillars of Hope. Just give you a little idea of what, what they're about and what their ministry is about. We're excited about coming alongside of them in this season and supporting them and encouraging them. Uh, way back when I got exposed to it, my first reaction is it's like, you know, human trafficking in the Bay Area. It's like, come on. I mean, we're like suburban, you know, middle class. What are you talking about? But the truth is, is this stuff happens. It's not in inner city stuff and it's not in foreign lands. It's actually in suburban areas as well. And it affects all of us. And I think it's a great ministry. It's a great opportunity for us to come alongside a, a, a ministry that isn't doing what we're doing. And that's the whole idea of selecting them. 
we don't want to come alongside of a, a, an organization that's doing what we're doing, but we want to come alongside of them. And we want to begin to practice being good at being rich. And we want to be a blessing to them. And so watch this video. Pastor Eric will come up and talk about the end. Go ahead and run it. Smiling but you're broken, hurting, belly coping, out there waiting, hoping for someone somewhere to tell you what you're missing so you can get to living. You feel way beyond forgiving. You tried everything. You're not too far away. You can't fall too far to say. So uh, that's the organization, organization that we're going to be supporting is Pillars of Hope, and uh, it's a community outreach. It's a nonprofit, as it says up there on the screen, and they rely on uh, donations and support that's provided. And so what we'd like to do as a church family is, is be a blessing to them uh, financially as well as otherwise, but with no strings attached. And so if you'd like to give in support of Pillars of Hope, there's some envelopes on your chairs in the pockets or on the chairs uh, where you're sitting. And so you can designate a gift uh, in that envelope. You can also contribute online at laurelridgechurch.org slash give. Uh, in the drop-down menu, just select Community Impact, and that'll go directly to this, uh, this fund that we're building up for Pillars of Hope. Um, if you'd like to think about it or you're not ready to give today, we're going to be continuing this for, for a couple more weeks, and so you've got a little bit of time to think